Okay, hi everyone. My name is Leo Hickman. I'm the editor of Carbon Brief and welcome to today's webinar. Um, so we've got this fantastic panel today to discuss this um, sort of ever topical and fascinating um, subject of meat and dairy consumption in a kind of world of trying to tackle climate change. Um, I've got um, my colleagues Josh um, Gabatis and Daisy Dunn who are on hand to moderate this session. So I'm going to step back and, and hand over to them. But um, this is going to be a fascinating discussion, so I'm really looking forward to it. So I'll, I'll hand over to Daisy and Josh. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, as Leo said, uh, we, we've been looking at uh, food and climate change. Um, specifically this week, we've been running a series on this topic. Uh, it's something that we've covered quite extensively before, um, writing about the latest scientific papers, um, reports from uh, organisations like the Committee on Climate Change, but we thought it merited a uh, kind of special carbon brief treatment, so we've dedicated a whole series of articles to this. Um, so, and it's culminated in this, this webinar, and as Leo said, we've got a fantastic panel of experts for you today. Um, so food production accounts for about a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions uh, and meat and dairy specifically, about 14.5%. Uh, the idea of diets and climate change being linked is something that's uh, become more of a, a mainstream idea. Um, it's been talked about by the IPCC, um, it's received a lot of attention in the media and it's often framed as kind of scientists and NGOs. Uh, telling people they need to eat less meat and dairy. Um, this is a kind of a controversial topic. Um, it's also very complicated. Uh, so today we want to kind of talk about some of the complexities of this topic. Um, each of our speakers will give a short introductory talk and then we'll have plenty of time for questions from the audience. Um, so if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box uh, on Zoom, uh, not the chat box. Uh, and we'll pick out some of the, the highlights and address them to our speakers. Um, so I'll pass over to my colleague Daisy now. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. So our first speaker is Pete Smith. Pete Smith is a professor of soils and global change at the University of Aberdeen. He is also science director of Scotland's Climate Change Centre of Expertise and has, uh, has, has served as a convening lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So Pete is going to talk about the environmental impact of meat and dairy and how this compares to other food groups. And just to let everyone know, Pete has to leave our webinar 15 minutes early to attend another event. So we will deal with questions aimed specifically at him early on in the Q&A after all our panellists have spoken. So Pete, if you'd like to take it away. Thanks very much, Daisy. Um, so the question, do we need to stop eating meat and dairy if we're to tackle climate change? Uh, I'm just going to present some of the facts for you so, to let you make up your own mind. Um, so uh, as um, Josh said in the introduction, um, food is responsible for about a quarter to a third of all greenhouse gas emissions that we emit on the planet. Um, of that 26% of greenhouse gas emissions, animal products, um, uh, contribute a disproportionate amount towards those emissions. So 58% of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the food system come from animal products, despite the fact that they, produce, they contribute um, uh, proportionately less to our nutrition. And of those 58% uh, contribution from animal products, beef and lamb alone contribute about half of those, so it's about 50%. Um, if you look at the other graph that I put on here, this is just showing uh, the uh, emissions intensity of different food products. So what you can see here is that ruminant meat um, has a, a very large contribution in terms of greenhouse gas equivalents per kilocalorie of nutrition provided compared to um, the plant-based products, which is shown up here. But this, this situation is not only um, seen for climate change. If we look at land use, we have a similar effect. Um, ruminant uh, animals, ruminant meat, um, contributes significantly more to, to, to land occupation, um, to energy use, to water quality, and to air quality. So 
what we can see is that um, the ruminant meat has about 10 to 100 times the impact um, of, of uh, uh, on climate change, land use, energy, water pollution and air pollution compared to the plant-based products. So we should definitely consume less livestock products. So this is my uh, ending pitch. Um, uh, if we don't stop eating meat and dairy, um, we at least have to uh, significantly, significantly cut back on it. So whilst I wouldn't say everybody needs to be become vegan, every little helps. And the people who continue to choose eating meat and dairy need to consume significantly less. I'll leave it there. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that, Pete. Um, so now the ne our next speaker will be uh, Helen Harwatt, who is uh, a senior research fellow at Chatham House and food and climate policy fellow at Harvard Law School. Uh, at the end of last year, she wrote a letter to uh, Lancet Planetary Health calling for agricultural transformation and a time frame for peak livestock as part of countries' renewed uh, Paris Agreement targets. Uh, that was signed in agreement by over 100 leading scientists. Um, so Helen, over to you. Hi everyone, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to focus on the carbon opportunity path. So we understand a lot of the impacts already that Pete just presented on in terms of greenhouse gases and land use emissions of different types of agriculture but we have much less understanding about the opportunity cost of the current food production. So myself and a team of colleagues explored this in relation to carbon opportunity cost, asking what, the, um, what, what could the land currently occupied by animal agriculture deliver in terms of carbon sequestration and therefore help to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So we took maps of the land used to grow feed crops and permanent pasture land and laid that onto vegetation maps that show the native vegetation types and the carbon sequestration potential of restoring that vegetation. So these three charts you can see are from the article that we published last week in Nature Sustainability. So first of all, figure one here. So this shows the additional carbon sequestration that could occur if pasture and feed crop lands were returned to the native vegetation cover which we disaggregated into forest and grassland. So the depth of the colour here represents the amount of carbon that could be sequestered with the darkest shade representing the biggest amount per area. So this is the carbon sequestered in addition to that already being sequestered by pasture, for example. And it might be surprising to see that even in areas such as Ireland here, well, which we couldn't consider as being very green, could actually be quite a bit greener. So the total amount of carbon sequestration in this global scenario was 153 gigatons of carbon. And we can think of this as the carbon opportunity cost of animal agriculture production. So around 72% of this amount comes from restoring pasture land and feed crop land around 28%. So in addition to looking at the sequestration amounts by region, we also looked at it by country income groupings. And what we found is that around 70% of the sequestration potential occurs in high and upper middle income countries. So this is roughly split between cropland and pasture in high income countries, and around 70% from rewilding pasture in upper middle income countries. So moving on to figure three, we also looked at diet shifts and the amount of carbon that could be sequestered if the land spared was returned to its native vegetation cover. So here we have the business as usual. So if we continue on the current trajectory to 2050, taking into account population and demand and optimistic um, yield improvements, that's still um, insufficient to meet the expected animal feed demand and actually results in further land use clearing. Um, and hence that emissions amount there. So under an Eat Lancet diet, which is around 70% less meat than the business as usual, so that's this column here, we found that was actually sequestered around 332 gigatons of CO2, equal to around nine years of current CO2 emissions. And finally, the vegan diet, we found that this would sequester around 550 gigatons, equal to around 
16 years of fossil fuel emissions. So I think considering the carbon opportunity cost in this way helps to basically anchor diet shifts much more firmly in the climate change mitigation discourse, given that we need to remove large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere in addition to reducing emissions on the ground in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. And currently, the, the, really the only option that we have to do this is by growing vegetation and sequestering CO2 that way, at the scale that's required at least. And I will end there for now. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. We've had a few people saying that um, the audio for that was a little bit unclear, so I apologise for that. And hopefully, Helen can have a, a play with her audio settings while we move on to the next speaker. So our next speaker is um, Dr. Modi Matswama, who is a nutritionist and public health expert based at the Wellcome Trust, where she's the senior science lead for food systems, nutrition and health. She has been involved in various food and environment initiatives, including helping to secure the inclusion of sustainability in the UK government's Eat Well Guide. And she recently also appeared at the UK Climate Assembly. Modi is going to talk a bit about global meat consumption levels and the associated health impacts. So take it away, Modi. Thank you. Hi everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I was just having um, an issue just getting the, the PowerPoint up on, um, on screen, but hopefully um, this should be. I can see that, yeah. You can see that. Perfect. Um, okay, so I'm going to basically give a brief overview of some of the impacts of meat on health. Um, and, and my slide um, summarizes. Um, yeah, some of these impacts. So on the left, you can see the planetary health diet, um, which was produced in the Eat Lancet report published last year. Um, and that report did a, a global assessment of um, what um, the, the food systems impacts on health and the environment at the moment. And it came up with a reference diet, which was recommending the proportions of different foods we should all be eating in order to meet um, health goals that governments have signed up to, as well as environmental goals. It assessed the food system as it currently stands today in terms of global production and consumption and found that on average, um, meat intakes in the world are double what they should be for people's health and the environment and fruit and veg vegetable intakes are half what they should be for people's um, health and the environment. So as a, as a world globally, we need to halve our intakes of meat and double our intakes of plant-based foods um, like fruit, vegetables, um, beans and pulses. Um, the high intakes of um, animal source foods are led primarily by high income countries. Um, an example is given on the, in the middle of the slide of the US um, diet, a typical US diet mapped out or co compared to the planetary boundaries in the Eat Lancet diet, which is um, the kind of the orange circle. And what you can see is that in high income countries such as the US and the European region, animal source foods far exceed what is needed for health um, and environmental reasons. Um, with, for instance, beef, um, red meat um, exceeding the planetary boundaries by around 600% in the US. The amount of excess varies by um, country, but in general, high income countries have um, far excess. Um, low in and middle income countries um, still have a way to go um, in terms of um, they're not at the planetary boundary yet for um, animal source foods. Um, so, what are the health impacts of um, these? Um, excess meat consumption patterns that we're seeing in parts of the world. Um, the health impacts to some degree depend on what the rest of the diet looks like. Um, I will start off by saying that. Um, and they can just be split into two. One is um, the direct impacts of consumption and the other is the indirect impacts linked to the way livestock is produced. In terms of the direct impacts linked to consumption, um, first of all, there are positive benefits associated with meat. It can be part of a healthy and sustainable diet if eaten in small amounts, up to around um, 200 grams a week, or that might be consuming meat once or twice a day. Um, it's a quality source of protein and, and micronutrients um, like zinc and iron. And so in low-income countries where perhaps the diet might be not very, very varied, particularly for young children, having meat in the diet can be a very good source of nutrition to help them grow and develop. Um, however, when you have excess um, meat consumption patterns, as seen in the US and other parts of the world, 
Um, studies have shown that this excessive consumption is linked with a raised risk of colon cancer, in particular in the case of processed foods, but then also other conditions like um, heart disease and diabetes. Um, there are also um, food safety issues around consumption of meat and around um, a third of foodborne illness illnesses um, have been linked to um, animal source foods. Um, livestock in particular um, are reservoirs um, and sources of some of the most, um, uh, I guess, dangerous pathogens for human health. Some um, very, um, I guess, um, some of the more um, uh, dangerous strains of salmonellas and other um, um, bacteria, for instance, that don't necessarily have um, effective treatments available. Um, and then there are a group of, um, as I said before, indirect um, health risks linked to um, meat production. They include for farm workers um, a raised risk of respiratory illnesses, as well as people living near large intensive um, animal farms, factories, processing plants. Um, antimicrobial resistance is also linked to intensive livestock farming, which relies on antibiotics to prevent the animals getting sick because they're in such confined conditions. Um, that leads to antimicrobial resistance, which then often um, puts workers at increased risk of catching those pathogens, um, and they then are not be able to respond to um, the treatments that are available. Um, antimicrobial resistance is one of the major growing global challenges and is prevalent in all countries of the world. Um, and then the other group of um, health conditions associated with um, meat um, livestock production are zoonotic diseases, which is the transfer of um, diseases from animals to humans. Um, COVID-19, which we're currently all um, living or suffering under, is a, an example of um, a zoonotic disease. And um, with increasing production and consumption of, of meat, um, we're going to potentially see increases in these kinds of um, zoonotic um, diseases happening. Um, so another reason why we need to think about how we check the amount of livestock that is being produced and consumed. So in summary, um, at the global level, we're all eating and consuming too much um, um, livestock. Um, this is having, this has um, adverse impacts on health, um, including direct impacts through the, the raised risk of um, non-communicable diseases, um, and then indirect impacts such as um, raised risks of zoonotic diseases. Um, there are some groups in the population, and perhaps in, particularly in low-income countries, who might benefit from um, a small increase um, in meat consumption. But in general, the global averages need to come down, particularly led by high-income and high-consuming countries. Thank you. That's great. Thank, thank you for that, Modi. Um, we'll now go to our final speaker before going into uh, questions. Um, so our final speaker is Dr. Tara Garnett, who's a, a researcher at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Um, she founded the Food Climate Research Network in 2005, uh, which later this year, I believe, will be replaced by a new initiative called TABLE. Um, Tara will discuss the, the different influences on people's diets um, and the implications these have for, for policy. Thank you. Um, so yes, I mean, I think what the other speakers have made clear is that we need to substantially reduce our consumption of animal products alongside major changes in other aspects of what we eat. And of course, alongside changes in how we produce the food, including the animal products that we do produce. So if we are going to go about doing this, how? Um, to, Lots and lots of measures have been proposed from everything such as taxes to bans to informational and social media campaigns. Um, but in order to really get a sense of what we need to do, I think we need to understand why we eat what we eat at the moment. And it's fantastically um, complex and multifaceted. So, you know, just to start with the innermost circle of this slide, we, we are born with basic biological urges for certain types of foods and these are very much shaped from the very onset of our birth and indeed pre-birth by uh, what our families eat, what our mothers eat, what we know about food, what we have access to within the household, as well as kind of wider beliefs and values and family norms. And then at a kind of wider level, that kind of middle pink circle, um, 
what we what we eat is is shaped by uh, what we can afford. Obviously, that's massively important. What we have access to, whether we live in a place with shops, with markets, what sorts of foods are available in our local environment, um, what 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 foods are safe and perceived to be safe, and what are not safe. Um, and then I think there is this sort of vague idea of what we eat, what we eat, which is very very important, but sort of intangible it's it's that they're invisible it's like to take for example breakfast the idea that um of what time we have breakfast what's normal to eat for breakfast the very fact that we have a meal that is called breakfast these are things that we take for granted but but they are constructs of our of our society that that and for each and everything this idea that for example meat is part of a normal meal and that not eating it might be abnormal we can see that that is show, totally slowly changing but it's been very um dominant for, for such a long time now so so those ideas um also influences on consumption and then the much broader uh range of ideas on uh, who's who's in charge of our food supply so we're talking about corporations and agribusiness and um, by physical influences on our consumption habits so what we grow in our locality what we import from the kind of the the um, environment of, of other countries um, obviously the legal frameworks of what 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 we try how we trade what's what's legal to consume what standards there are what local policies are in place regarding for example the sighting of a of another fast food outlet or the absence of sighting of another food, school standards in meals as well as r d so again to take a meat example um the fact that fresh milk is cheap and widely available is a product of research and development not just genetics but also long um, sophisticated transport routes which enable grains to be shipped around the world or the, the miracle of refrigeration which means that um, that that fresh milk is available all year round for everyone so all these things are massive influences on consumption this is all a very long way round of saying if we are going to change how we consume there is no one thing that we have to do in isolation we have to address every single aspect of this circle we need to address obviously we have trade which is very very dominant in discussions in the uk at the moment we have to consider what public and private um, investment there is in research and development and how that enhances or undermines the sustainability of what we consume we have to consider the meso level influences on consumption such as um, fair wages for people so that food is affordable um, access to all people everywhere um, advertising regulations um, food quality and safety and all those things will, will 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 again have an influence and then and then we have to tackle the the more early stage influences the, the closer influences which is to do with um, support for, um, for for young families for people who are starting a family school meals policies um, education and knowledge within the school curriculum and and beyond so all those things there isn't a single one thing to do but all those things will collectively have an impact on what and how we consume thank you thank you very much tara um thanks to all our speakers i just like to say all the slides will be available after this webinar and also a recording of this webinar will be posted so no worries if you miss anything during the presentations we're now going to open it up to questions so just a reminder if you'd like to ask a question to any one of our panelists please use the q a box um, my first question that I'm going to ask uh, was sent by email from Arshad Siddiqui, who's in Karachi in Pakistan. His question is, should we stop eating meat totally or would it be okay to just curtail it? I think a lot of our speakers, or maybe one of them, would have an answer to this question. So maybe if we first go to Pete and then we can follow on to Helen, Modi, Tara, if they would also like to contribute. Thanks. Uh, yes. So uh, anything helps. So cutting emissions helps in any way so um, we could if we could totally get rid of fossil fuels that would be great but if we could just reduce them then that makes a contribution it's the same uh, argument with 
uh, livestock products really um, if you're not ready to to take the <laughs> the once in a lifetime decision to never eat meat and consumed dairy again um, most people consume about twice as much protein as they need and you could cut back on that consumption without any uh, adverse impact and it would be better for the climate so everyone can make a contribution not just people who choose to become vegetarian or vegan um, people who continue to eat meat could make a significant contribution just by cutting out meat for a, a few meals a, a week and consuming smaller portion sizes of meat. Thanks. Is there anyone else that would like to answer that question as well? Yeah, thanks, Daisy. I hope, is my sound better now? That's much better, yeah, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think if we look at it in terms of what Pete said, but also from a climate change mitigation perspective, if we're looking at maximum potentials, then that would be sort of a vegan world scenario. Um, so I think it depends on how much we want to reduce from the food sector versus other sectors. But I think really under the precautionary approach, we need to be looking at maximum reductions from all sectors in order to give us the best chance of actually achieving the temperature goals under the Paris Agreement and also not excessively increasing temperature. Tara, I saw your hand go up there. Yeah, I'd just like to um, qualify slightly um, three in three ways, really. I think the first is that we have to always consider what it is we choose to eat instead of eating meat, and all foods have an impact. The, there are averages, but the variations within the averages also need to be borne in mind. Um, the, second, the second point to make is the kind of the danger of the halo effect um, and the risk that you say, well, right, I've gone vegan, I can, I can fly around the world and like, because I've, I've kind of expiated my, my carbon sins. That's, that's a real psychological thing and it's dangerous. And the third thing is I'd go back to um, Modi's point, which is that um, people are in different contexts in different parts of the world. What else do you and do you not have access to? And if you are eating mainly grains or tubers or, and, and diets that are really lacking in uh, nutrient diversity, then a little bit of meat or, or, or dairy can make a life or death difference to particularly to young children. So I think, I think it's not a one size fits all approach. Okay, uh, assuming that, uh, uh, Moni, I don't know if you wanted to come in on that as well. Um, okay, I, I'll move on to our next question. Um, so this one is another one from, from email. This has come from Abraham Mavero, who's a PhD student in Ethiopia studying climate smart dairy farming. Um, he says stopping eating livestock products isn't an option, especially, isn't always an option, especially for a developing country whose economy depends on livestock farming. Um, why don't we try other options, for example, improving dairy capital productivity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Um, again, I think this is one that a lot of people could address. I'll, I'll, I'll go for Helen first, um, but I think potentially others will want to come in on this one. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, I think it's a really good question. And I think just going back to the analysis that we just published that I presented, but I'm not sure the sound was very good. So one of the charts there showed that around 70% of, of the carbon opportunity costs from animal agriculture is actually in high income and upper middle income countries. And last year we published a call to... Um, transform agriculture and we specifically called for high and middle income countries to start making those moves basically. So I think really the focus on action should be on high and middle income countries but at the same time not outsourcing their animal product production to low income countries. That's a really crucial part of that shift. Does anyone else want to come in on that one? Uh, Tara? Just just a couple of points. I, I totally recognize what you're saying and where you're coming from. But I think um, I think one of the 
one of the issues is obviously the extent to which intensification is uh, compatible or incompatible with um, animal welfare. And up to a point, there is a, a strong relationship. Greater intensification, better diets and so forth is good for welfare, reduced uh, zoonotic disease transmission. But after a while, that, those, um, that relationship starts to fray and you start to have to think of the ethics of production. Um, there's also the question of uh, the GFON's paradox that insofar as intensification leads to more so-called efficient production, which can reduce the cost of production, which can be passed on to consumers. Obviously in low income settings, this is a good thing, but beyond a quite certain point, uh, diets become increasingly meat dependent and, and the, the benefits in terms of reduced carbon emissions of intensification are outweighed by ongoing increases in demand. So, that is the case with intensification. You know, we have vastly more efficient light bulbs than we did 100 years ago, but we have millions and millions more light bulbs than we have today than we ever have before. And those, uh, the, the environmental impacts are therefore, in absolute terms, greater. Great, thanks, Tara. Um, so our next question is from Carolyn Heyman. She says, the Climate Assembly has said we need to reduce meat and dairy consumption by 20 to 40%, but it has to be voluntary. What's likely to be the best way to achieve a voluntary reduction? Um, Modi, I know you were involved in the Climate Assembly, so I don't know if you want to speak to this one. Yeah, thanks, and that's a really good question. Um, there are different ways um, you can help people to achieve um, a voluntary reduction. Um, for in, one, one example is making um, plant-based alternatives or vegetarian options more available. Um, Eating Better um, recently published a survey of, um, for instance, the plant-based options or non-meat options available in ready meals um, in the UK. And it found that whilst um, the number of um, vegetarian options available has increased to around 24% of ready meals, um, still the vast majority of ready meals in supermarkets currently still contain um, some form of either meat um, or other animal source food like cheese um, or, or dairy or other dairy. So what is increasing availability um, of alternatives in supermarkets, in restaurants, um, also improving people's cooking skills. So things like classes are a very good um, source of protein as well as um, fiber, which we also need to increase our intakes of, but often people might not necessarily know how to cook them. Um, if, you, if you buy the dried varieties, you have to soak them, you know, for at least 12 hours before you cook them. And so could there be some innovative ways to have new products on the market that you don't have to, you know, plan 24 hours in advance before you actually cook them that, you can just have instant ready meals that, um, not necessarily ready meals, but instant pulses that can, can be cooked straight away. So there's scope for innovation in the market in, in that way as well. Um, so those are like, you know, that's a flavor of some of the examples. I mean, and then I think there is also, whilst the question was around voluntary, I think there's also, um, you know, potentially a role for um, price based mechanisms and um, the government to also, you know, encourage this kind of sh shift and nudges in the right direction. So um, the reason I say that, for example, is um, when you look at things like agriculture subsidies um, in most countries of the world, um, the bulk of agriculture subsidies tend to go to supporting livestock. There's very little investment in um, fruit and vegetables um, or plant based foods like pulses. And so that kind of continues to um, skew the system towards meat, making it more cheap less investment in the alternatives that people could be eating. Fantastic, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to go, there's been, just to say, uh, there have been a lot of questions coming in, so we're, um, we're trying to keep track of them all. I'm gonna address one to you, Pete, just because um, there have been a couple um, directly to you and I'm aware of, of time. Um, so, Someone has asked, uh, Jack Miller has said, and this kind of speaks to a lot of questions that have come in. Um, sorry. Sorry, excuse me. Um, could you talk a little about differences in um, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, implications of different agricultural practices across countries, specifically the point often made by UK farming community that the British, British beef is less carbon intensive than other places in the world? 
Yes, so there's quite a big difference in the um, the greenhouse gas footprint of foods that we produce in this country and others. Um, because you divide the productivity by the greenhouse gas emissions, um, the, the big difference is uh, largely driven by productivity. So where you have a low productivity in many developing countries, um, you tend to have a higher greenhouse gas footprint. So there is some, there's, uh, there's some truth in the fact that the, um, in, just in terms of greenhouse gases, um, the food production in, in the sort of industrialized countries does have a lower greenhouse gas footprint per unit of product. But in whatever country you're in, you still have that big divergence between um, the ruminant products at one end and the plant-based products at the other end. And that's much bigger than any difference that you get in production systems. Fantastic, thank you. I, I don't know if anyone else wants to address that question as well. If not, we'll move on to the next one, Daisy. Thanks, yeah. So got a question here from Alana Hogg. She says, as more people adopt pescatarian diets, fueling their ongoing global growth in fish consumption, should we be just as concerned about the negative impacts of capture fisheries and aquaculture as we are with meat and dairy? Um, so Tara, I don't know if you want to address this question first. Um, uh, yes, I think we should be. I think we should, um, I mean, the, the, the I'm not a sort of a particular specialist on 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 fish, but the story of our treatment of the oceans is is a shameful one and um, a very frightening one. When it comes to aquaculture, um, generally the, the the carbon footprint studies show that on the whole they have lower carbon footprints than many animal products. But there are certain issues to bear in mind. One is that. Um, some of these aquaculture products, particularly the ones we like to eat, such as the kind of salmon uh, type species, um, are partly dependent on the feeding of wild fish to them in order in particular to, to have those omega-3 fatty acids, which are the subject of marketing campaigns. So there is the link with capture fisheries there. The second is what else do they eat? They tend to eat grains and soy and so forth. So some of those issues are going to be uh, shared with the issues that you have with, um, with with animal products and so forth, which is not to say that they may not be part of the solution, but I think what is interesting to look at is where there is scope for looking at uh, aquatic species that perhaps don't have the kind of perhaps the animal welfare, animal sentience issues, um, and that aren't reliant on uh, capture capture fisheries, so some of the bivalves are, are a clear case in point there, as well as looking at uh, other aquaculture products such as um, seaweeds and algae, which are, you know, always the subject of, you know, sporadic interest and it never really goes very far, but it'd be nice to see uh, more work and more progress in that area. Okay, fantastic. Um, so our next question, um, I'm going to, this is one that's come in from quite a few different people, um, including from uh, Harry Mack, who's a uh, carbon reduction projects manager at the Broads Authority. Um, this question is about the debate around grass-fed cattle versus other systems. Um, so essentially, is there a clear scientific consensus on the value of these grass-fed systems and promoting this product in place of other red meat. Um, I'm going to take this to uh, Pete, but I think other people will have uh, strong views on it as well. So I'll go through. Yeah. So grass-fed um, uh, meat production has a um, is sort of much better for animal welfare and various other metrics. But in climate change terms, actually, it's it's not a lot better. Or in fact even worse than the industrial uh, produced beef and the reason for that is that you you get animals up to their slaughter weight quickly so they've had less days to emit methane in their life we get them up to the slaughter weight quickly and we slaughter them before they've emitted so much methane so actually the greenhouse gas emission per unit of product is lower for industrially produced beef um, so if you just looked at it with climate blinkers on 
you'd say that the grass-fed beef didn't have any advantage over the over the industrial one. But of course, there are many other things to consider other than climate change. So, uh, you know, they should also be taking into account the animal welfare is better and various other things. But it's not, it's not, you know, as I said before, you've got grass-fed beef and uh, industrial beef, and they're uh, 10 to times greater impact than the plant-based products. So we shouldn't be really arguing about which one's better at that end. We should shift away from that end of the spectrum and move towards plant-based plant -based products. Thanks, Pete. Um, I'm going to, I don't know. Yeah, I thought, I thought Tara might want to come in on this as well. Um, so I'll go to you, Tara. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, what is the context of consumption and what is the context of production is the key, is the key point. Um, I, you could imagine a scenario where you say, okay, we're, we just can't do anything about demand, in which case the so-called least bad option might be to give people battery chickens to eat. Another context of consumption is where you can say, okay, we are going to shift towards more healthy and sustainable diets that include a small quantity of animal products, in which case you harness the benefits of grass-fed livestock production, which includes the recycling of nutrients, includes the using of land that is unsuited to crop productions, that includes the um, the maintenance of landscapes that we have come to like, although they are human made, and which includes the animal welfare benefits. If that is going to work as a scenario, and if those benefits are going to, um, to be obtained, then you're going to have to substantially, really radically reduce your consumption of animal products. On a personal level, I would like to see that world better than I would like to see a world in which we manage the problem by intensifying our livestock production. Okay, so we'll move on to another question now. Thanks for that, Tara. So we had a couple of questions about this um, topic. So just picking this one out from Will Smith, can someone please discuss the health and climate impacts of plant-based meats? So the kind of alternatives to burgers that we've been seeing rising in popularity um, Modi, I don't know if you want to talk about the health impacts, first of all. Sure, yeah, thanks. That's a really good question. And basically, the health impacts of plant-based um, meats and alternatives depend on what they're made of and um, on the ingredients that are going into making them. Um, so often, you might um, they're made on things like um, they've got added palm oil, which is a source of saturated fats, which in general, most people need to be eating less of. And they also have added ingredients like salt and other additives, um, which perhaps people also need to be cutting their intakes of. So um, the plant-based products that have a high amounts of things like added salt um, and saturated fat, um, have the nutrition profile of them isn't that significantly different to regular burgers. Um, they might be a bit better for the greenhouse gas emissions, but I'll let others talk about that. Um, and so in that case, then you're not necessarily doing um, very much um, for your health. You know, the health difference isn't any different. And the other thing with plant-based um, alternatives such as burgers is, is if all you're doing is replacing one form of unhealthy eating, burgers generally come with a side of chips and sometimes it might be a Coke or a milkshake, which is also high in sugar. The, the unhealthy eating pattern is still maintained. And so all the other accompaniments, which are also part of that unhealthy diet um, are kind of the same. Um, people often don't have um, a side of vegetables with um, their kind of burger and chips. If you go out, that's the standard you know, package. So um, there are some questions around the healthiness of um, some types of alternative proteins. Others, you know, perhaps some types of corn, or, um, or, or which might be used, for instance, instead of meat, might be okay. But you really need to, what we need is very clear nutrition labeling. So people are able to make informed choices with maybe things like traffic lights or, or warnings to show where they aren't compatible with health objectives. Thanks. Helen, do you have your hands up there to add something in? Yeah, thanks, Daisy. So just purely on the greenhouse gas perspective of meat analogues or plant-based meat. So we published a greenhouse gas assessment of meat analogues last year, and we found that taking an average from three different factories that produce meat analogues in three different countries, all using different production techniques and ingredients, the, the average footprint, the greenhouse gas footprint, was around a third of that compared to chicken. 
Um, it was still around twice as much as pulses. So if we're looking to, again, like I was talking about kind of maximum gains, we'd be looking for more of a whole foods, plant-based diet to achieve the maximum reductions. Uh, Peter, do you want to add something too? No, nothing to add what, to what Helen said. Uh, the greenhouse gas, as Modi said, the, the, um, the, the, the health aspects uh, vary and may not be too different from meat, but the greenhouse gas footprint is way lower. I've got to go now. See ya. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, as I said, we've, we've had a lot of questions come in and we will uh, try and get through them. Uh, we, we will try and see if we can publish a few uh, responses on, on our website afterwards. So uh, thank you for, for taking part, Pete. Um, okay, now I'm moving on to our next question. Uh, I'll, I'll put this to Helen. Um, again, this is a question which speaks to uh, a lot of the questions that we've had coming in. Um, Corey Ruha has asked, for many people living rurally, uh, meat and dairy has been a way of life for their families for generations. Uh, convincing farmers to change their livelihoods would be a huge mission. Uh, what would you suggest is the best way to practically transition away from purchasing land for meat and dairy livestock? Thanks, Josh. Yeah, really good question and really important aspect as well to bring farmers into this equation. And that's something that I'm um, moving my, my research into. So I think there's different options. So not all farmers could necessarily just transition from animal agriculture to arable or horticulture because it depends on the suitability of that land. So in some cases, for example, some pasture land is much more suitable to rewild the vegetation and actually repurpose that land as a climate change mitigation measure to sequester carbon on that instead of food production. So I think it's we also we need to bear in mind that land use as it currently is isn't static and that applies to agricultural land use as well and the world is changing quite quickly and I think we also need to consider that so um, yeah, just to summarise, it, it's going to take, as Tara said, quite a variety of different instruments to incentivise and to actually um, help help secure livelihood. So we could think of it as carbon far farming instead of sort of food farming. Um, so I think it, it does require some quite different perspectives and policy approaches to what we've currently seen. Great, thanks. So moving on to another question. This one's from Paul Pernell. He says, if we are eating meat that has an organic food certification, is that as destructive to the environment? So Tara, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about organic meat. Uh, yes, I mean, I think this, some of the points are, are covered with, with the points I made above that organic is a kind of multi-dimensional set of criteria are, are part of the label, including uh, around animal welfare, including about having a large proportion of grass fed in the diet and so on and so forth. I think when you, you look at sort of traditional life cycle assessments, what, what they tend to find is partly that there's a massive range between this category called organic on the one hand, this category called conventional on the other, but on the whole, because there is a larger grass component in the organic cow's diet, uh, they have higher methane emissions, so that looks as if the impacts are greater, and they tend to use more land. Now, how one understands the, the impacts of methane over time, it's, a, it's an intensive greenhouse gas on the one hand, but its impacts are transitory. That's a, a long discussion that we probably don't have time to go in there. The long and short of it, however, is that whether you're choosing organic or not organic, the main priority is to substantially cut down on your consumption. There are very good reasons for um, choosing organic, perhaps on the basis of animal welfare, but there is no there is no answer on earth that is going to get out the fact that we need to be substantially cutting down if you're a high 
consuming individual on animal products. It doesn't mean necessarily eliminating, but it does mean that we need to be using more land for uh, rewilding, as Helen's pointed out, and that we need to be harnessing the value of livestock in contexts where they are beneficial, um, which is certainly not at the scale that we have today. Great, thank you, Tara. Um, so the next question comes from uh, Ashok Palm Palmaswaran, um, and he asks, which national government, if any, has the most progressive policies to reduce meat consumption, and what are these policies? Um, again, this is quite similar to another question from Victoria Lachlan, who has asked if there are any emerging best, best practices. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, again, this could be answered by any number of you. I will go to uh, Modi first, um, if you are up for answering that. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good question, actually. Um, <laughs> and one, one which I was thinking, yeah, how, you know, how, how do I answer this? Um, there's different entry points you can take. Um, one, for instance, is looking at including um, environmental impact labelling on foods. I think one of the Nordic countries, potentially Denmark, um, has, is exploring ways to, um, or has already developed an environmental impact label, which can be one way of people being able to choose foods with lower um, greenhouse gas emissions. That's one good place. That's, that's like one example um, of a good place to start. Um, there are also a number of countries which have produced um, food-based dietary guidelines, a bit like the, um, the Eat Lancet reference, reference guide that I, I presented in my um, in my short talk and some of them have actually started advising or making recommendations for um, that people should cut that back on meat um, for their health and also for the environment um, which is already quite a bold move um, the US tried to include such a recommendation when it updated its food-based dietary guidelines a year or two ago and because of strong lobbying from um, the meat lobby um, they weren't able to incorporate environmental um, considerations um, so, um, yeah, China is one example. I think some, again, some of the Nordics, the UK makes a reference to less meat in its food-based dietary guidelines. Um, so that's also perhaps, you know, another good example um, of a shift in the right direction. Um, and I think a, a, another example is, is countries that have started to promote um, perhaps more again on the production side there are others who are better placed to speak to this but you know diver diversifying the types of meat production away from just one type of intensive farming to perhaps more organic methods um, some countries have started to encourage um, you know an increase in organic food production for instance which could be good for reducing pesticides um, in the environment um, so those are just um, some reflections from my side Thank you. Does, does anyone else want to come in on that one? Okay, well, so, sorry, Tara. Just to say that most of the good practice, I think, is coming at a much more devolved level on the level of the sort of um, particular, the school or the local authority um, rather than at the national level where, where the track record is dismal and very cautious. Great. Uh, Daisy, over to you. <laughs> I think, Helen, did you want to add something? Yeah, just to add that, um, this hasn't made its way into policy yet, but recently the UK's Committee on Climate Change recommended to the UK government that they have around 20% reduction in meat consumption to help meet the, the climate goals. Um, but they did say that this was expected to happen anyway, just by consumer trends and the way they're looking. So it's certainly not a radical goal and probably, as, as they say, might be something we see anyway. So it's not really a policy um, intervention as such. OK, thank you. Um, so we've had a couple of questions on this. So just to pick one from Dr. Christine Nell Nellis. Um, in terms of sustainability, where does lab grown meat figure? So I don't know, lab grown meat is obviously a bit of a wild card. If anyone feels comfortable taking this question on, maybe Tara, would you like to go or Helen or? Yeah, I mean, there have been studies which have sort of done hypothetical carbon footprint analyses of these um, still in development foods. And, and it's a question of kind of what your assumptions and what your assumptions about the methods are. 
Um, and again, the, the, so there was a study from colleagues at, at Oxford and, and the point they made was that um, firstly, it all depends on the energy intensity of the process. So the more energy intensity of the process, um, the less of a benefit it is as compared with regular meat. Um, and, um, and, but I mean, I think you could also make the point that what is your assumption about uh, decarbonisation in the energy sector and how that, how that balances balances things out. I think there's a, a wider point to be made about lab grown meat, which is partly to do with um, how we think of these novel foods in the diets and the extent to which we want to just sort of substitute one standard kind of food with another without actually changing the parameters of our diet, as, as Modi's pointed out. And the second point of view thing is that uh, it does raise questions about power in the supply chain and what the narrative is about our food problems is the food problem that we are defining as a problem that we need loads more protein to feed the world or do we have to reassess this this I guess fetishization of protein um, as a requirement for our future and do we have to think about how uh, power is concentrated within the supply chain it's again it's kind of Silicon Valley coming in and answering the world's problems again or do we need to take a more critical approach to how um, how we address our food systems problems does anyone else want to address that question before we move on uh, Modi? Um, yeah just to add very briefly to Tara's um, excellent synopsis of it depends um, with lab-grown meat, it's a very new novel area, as she was saying, and some types of lab-grown meat production actually rely on byproducts from the livestock industry. For instance, the growth substances to grow the cells in the lab um, come from grow, um, uh, byproducts of, of livestock. And so there's this interdependency between lab-grown meat and livestock itself. The initial cells to actually grow and produce the meat also come from animals, and they could either be sourced from dead animals or live animals that are grown specifically to provide those cells. So it's not necessarily this completely independent, um, you know, um, sector that has got no relation to the, to the, to the meat industry or, or, you know, the livestock um, as well. It, there are some interdependencies, which then depending on the processes that are used and um, will have impacts and implications for the emissions that are associated with it. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, just, to, just to give you a warning, we have about three minutes left on this. Uh, maybe have time for one or perhaps two uh, very short questions. Um, I will, the bit, another bit of a wild, wild card question from William Clark. Um, how does everyone feel about insects as feeds and foods? Um, again, uh, I don't know who, who would want to feel this one in particular. Does anyone, would anyone like to volunteer? Okay, Modi, go for it. Um, yeah, certainly the um, environmental impacts of insects are much lower than um, than beef. They are also um, potentially good sources of protein. Um, some of the research we've been funding has been looking into them as a potential protein source. Um, there are some potential downsides, though. To get, um, you know, let's say 100 grams of insect protein, you need to produce significantly more insects than you would, um, you know, to grow a chicken, for instance. Um, so they aren't necessarily completely environmental impact free. Um, some countries already, some regions and countries already already eat them um, as a natural protein source, parts of Latin America, parts of Africa. So I think for those who want to consume them, they are certainly potentially part of the solution. Um, and I would say go for it. Anyone else on that? Okay. Uh, do you have time for one more question, David? Right, okay, I'm just trying to find a quick question. Would any panelists, this is from Matthew Hill, would any panelists like to comment on the role of the food industry, especially supermarkets, on influencing our diet? So if anyone wants to take a quick go at this one. Yeah, they're very important. They um, determine in, you know, what the options are available for us to buy, for instance, in terms of can we get 
plant-based alternatives, pulses, um, whether there's meat-based alternatives on the shelves of the supermarket, they hold a lot of power. Um, they also price and place the products in places that make us buy them, things they place at the tills or the end of aisles, all influence our food choices. Um, so they essentially, you know, affect our choices to the, through the architecture of the way they structure um, uh, their, their stores and our access to food. So I think they're a really important part of the solution, very powerful and have a very important role to play. And again, some of the research we're funding at Welcome is looking at and working with supermarkets through things like product placement and um, other ways in which you can try and shift people's behaviour. Thank you so much. OK, I think that is pretty much all we have time for. But I'd like to thank all our panellists again for joining us and also thank my co-hosts Josh Gabatis and Leo Hickman and our science editor, Rob McSweeney, who has been collecting all your brilliant questions for us. And we're gonna try and answer some more of your questions. I know there's a lot that's left unanswered and potentially post them on our website so you'll be able to read the responses there. But thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thanks, bye everyone. Thanks everyone.